My name's Alex Hire. I'm the program director of Urban Beats, and today we have an artist coming up on stage who's gonna be doing some great poetry. Um, but first, I wanna tell you a little bit about our program and get you guys ready for today. So, we're gonna do a little crowd participation activity. All right, so when I say opportunity, I need you guys to say summit. I'm gonna point when I do it so you guys know the cue, right? Opportunity. Opportunity. See, I got some of you guys. Let's try it again. Opportunity. All right. I get those goosebumps every time, yeah. You come around, yeah. You ease my mind. You make everything feel fine. Worry about those comments. I'm way too, yeah. I'm way too numb, yeah. Yeah. I get those goosebumps every I get those goosebumps every opportunity. Opportunity. Let's go. So at Urban Beats, right, we're all about expressive arts. We want you guys to express yourselves. We want to connect you with employment, education, opportunities. They right, got you again. Um, and we really want to make sure that you have a, a space and a voice to express yourself. We serve ages 16 to 25, and our doors are open. Please come by. Check us out at sdurbanbeats.org. We're on all social medias. Please, uh, we have a table outside. You guys can check us out. But now, I want to introduce our artist. His name is Santos, and he has a great story. My name is Santos. Uh, usually, I have some super like lame name to my poem, so I didn't name this one. Just kidding. Uh, but I, I didn't name it. Anyways, um, waking up on a bad day. Heck. How will I wake up if I haven't slept? Haven't slept because I spent all night doing stuff like playing video games, listening to music, painting. I think to myself, maybe I should get some sleep, but I can't. They always come back and they never have nothing nice to say. So I do anything to make that makes it seem as if they don't exist. I do this till the sun comes up. I now have things to do, the responsibilities of being an adult, whatever that means. Uh, though they're still there. They're as if they're a shitty narrator of the story called my life. So I think to myself, maybe I should make up some type of excuse. An excuse to avoid my responsibilities because it's so hard to think straight. My thoughts are racing and I can't focus. I picture like constantly being followed around by a bully, but the bully always makes a big deal about what I do and how I do things and always points out the stuff I don't like about myself. But all this isn't real. It's just the voice in my head, the voice that follows me everywhere I go. Knowing this comes the fear that if I step outside, I'll have a mental breakdown. I feel so sensitive to every situation that seems stressful. It all becomes unpredictable. Will people think around me think I'm crazy? Will I end up in a psychiatric hospital? All these thoughts, feelings, and hallucinations make it hard to pick up the phone, and the rest of the day becomes unpredictable. Though waking up on a good day, I'm up and early, happy that the sun is at the right angle to shine light into my apartment, and happy that I lived another day. So I take a warm shower. It's like my cup of coffee in the morning. After that, I eat and I think about all I can accomplish, create, or do to get myself one step closer to achieving my goals. Then I proceed to do these things one step at a time because I'm tired of feeling crazy, feeling as if I carry a label around me everywhere I go. 
So I just want others to know and understand that li having schizoaffective disorder isn't easy. These are what mourning can be like in my shoes. The shoes of a person that wants more other than the fear of being labeled something less. The fear of a, the shoes, <laughs> the shoes of a person with schizoaffective disorder. So that's pretty much it, but It's a long story with my dealing with all these things, and um, I feel weird because if it wasn't for the people that um, support me and the, the treatment I went out to go get, I wouldn't be at where I'm at today. Um, it really just, yeah. Anyways, opportunity. All right, and I hope y'all enjoy. All right. We in it now. Thanks, Santos, for telling your story. That's what today is about. It's about speaking your truth. And so we appreciate you coming out and setting the tone like that. It's important for us that young people have the ability to share their story in front of less young people. So thank you for listening. So like I said, we're in it now. We, we want to get started fast. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're here and what we're doing today. Last year, we had this idea to do some research, bring some people together, talk a little bit about what we found, and we hope that a couple hundred people would show up, and you guys blew our minds, and 500 people showed up, and we had, to, we had to shut the doors and turn people away. This year, we got cocky. We said, let's try to go 600, maybe 700, and stretch goal 750. There's 800 of you all here tonight, so thank you again, once again for showing out San Diego. I never knew there were so many beautiful people in one place, so it's good to see you all. And especially in our world, it's social, in the social impact world, it's people, not profits, that is our bottom line. And so um, we're really excited to see that our movement to reduce youth disconnection is growing. So it's my job this morning in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes to talk a little bit about why we're here and what we're gonna do today. I'm going to start with a little history. So two years ago, I had the privilege to, to join some colleagues in Chicago for an Opportunity Youth National Convening, and it was the first time I was really exposed to this network of leaders and thinkers who are all working on this issue that they call youth disconnection. And I was inspired and filled up and um, really enjoyed my time. And as we were all leaving, a young man got up. He didn't even have a mic. He said, hey, before you all leave on your planes and trains and automobiles, I want you to remember this quote that my grandmother told me before she passed. She said, if the youth are not initiated into the village, they will burn it down just to feel its warmth. If the youth are not initiated into the village, they'll burn it down just to feel its warmth. And that quote stuck with me as I shuffled through security and found my Southwest middle seat, and it still sticks with me today. And I'm constantly thinking about if the youth how are San Diego initiating our youth into the village that is our community? There's a couple ways to think about that. One of the easiest ways is actually to pay attention to what we call youth disconnection rates, and so we did. We did research, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. But if you're new to this movement, you might be asking, like, why? Why is that something that we should care about when there's all this other noise going on in Washington, D.C., in our communities, in our city, in our region, why should we care about youth disconnection? Well, it turns out that disconnection in that critical time from childhood, that transition from childhood to adulthood, can actually leave scars that last a lifetime. It turns out that adults who have been disconnected from youth are much less likely um, to find gainful employment throughout life, much, have much lower living standards throughout life are much more likely to be incarcerated, are much more likely to be on public assistance, and have much less, have much lower health outcomes. Youth disconnection actually rips at the fabric that brings our communities together. And that has impacts for our public health, for our public safety, for our public finances. And if you're a hiring manager or you're a business leader here in San Diego, and young people 16 to 24 are actually not getting the skills and experience that they need during this transition period, it's gonna hurt your bottom line real quick when these young people actually don't have the skills and experience to do the work 
that you need done. And in the long term, it's going to hurt our region's global competitiveness in this 21st century economy that we all live in. But most importantly, this works about hope. And when I forget that around some of the contract negotiations and the audit requirements and the emails and the, the meetings that we all have to do, I kind of draw on stories from young people like Santos, and especially over the last nine months, six young people that formed what we called our Opportunity Youth Council. They helped interpret our data, inform our work, and actually set up a lot of the details of today as you guys walk through your day with us today. And so a big thank you to Jahir, Yacinto, Jasmine, Paulo, Anna, and Diego. Thank you. And if you see them today, you shake their hand, give them a hug. They set up this day, and so I just want to thank them for that. So, so a little bit about the data. What, last year, we set out a bold vision for youth, for youth and coming of age in San Diego and our community. And that vision is anchored by two big goals. The first goal is to cut the rate of youth disconnection to 7.3 by 2020, down from 9.7 when we first started looking at this work. And they got some good news and some bad news. On the plus side of the ledger, youth disconnection went down last year and this year. And actually, let me start this. I lay, we laid out some definitions last year. And I'm going to lay out some definitions again before we go too far, um, because definitions matter when we're talking about so many people working on the same problem. Youth disconnection is defined by 16 to 24-year-olds who are both not working and not in school. And sometimes you'll hear them say, like, talk about opportunity youth, because these are young people who have not, stepped, have not been given the chance to step in the opportunity that we know that they can. 16 to 24 year olds not working and not in school. That's what we're talking about. So goal one was to cut the rate from 9.7 in 2015 to our goal of 7.3 by 2020. And again, like I said, on the plus side of the ledger, we did that a little bit from 15 to 16. The youth disconnection rate went down by 9.4%. Our new number is 41,000 young people in San Diego County who are not working and not in school. The other kind of note on the plus side of the ledger is that all this activity, that improvement actually happened before we mobilized this community last year. The downside of the ledger, as you can see from the chart behind me, is actually we're not on track. If we continue to find these disconnection rates, reduce year over year for the next four years, we're actually not going to meet our goal of 7.3%. There's, there's a lot of work to be done yet, but that's where we stand. But it's, in our world, it's really easy just to talk about problems and to text about problems and to tweet about problems. It's a lot harder to kind of get a group of people and mobilize around solutions. So to make that a little bit easier, we break down youth dis disconnection in what we call three big buckets of youth dis disconnection. The first is disconnection in the education system. From those 41,000 people, about 20% of those young people have dropped out of the education system before getting a high school diploma. About half graduated high school but didn't make the jump to post-secondary education. And another quarter or so dabbled in college or some kind of post-secondary education but didn't finish. And that's a problem, especially in our 21st century economy when by 2020 it's predicted about 65% of the jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary education, whether that's an AA degree, a, voc a vocational training degree or credential, an apprenticeship or a four-year bachelor degree or beyond. The earlier someone falls behind in our skills economy, the faster opportunity slips away. The second big bucket of youth disconnection is youth unemployment, defined as young people are actively looking for work, submitting resumes, and hearing no back, and actually, in most cases, probably hearing nothing back. And in this, in this bucket, we actually made some, some gains year over year. The number of young people, of those 41,000, 13 of them, 13,000 are actively looking for work, but not hearing back. So we made some gains, and actually th those gains actually account for all of our gains in, in, in reducing youth disconnection year over year from 15 to 16. Um, but challenges persist, as you see behind me. In the, in the United States, February 2018, the youth disconnection rate nationally is still twice as high as the, as the unemployment rate for all folks. And when we talked with Jahir, one of the members of our youth council about this, he's saying like, man, it's just tough, right? Because like I'm applying for jobs, I'm requiring a bachelor's degree, I don't have one. They want experience, I don't have it. And it's just, I don't have this, I don't have that. And no one's actually willing to give me that first shot. Kind of his words when he was talking about this kind of soaked in exasperation. And actually, Grads of Life, a partner of ours was here, did some work on this recently. And they found that actually about two thirds of what we call middle skill jobs on their job postings require a bachelor's degree. 
but only about 15% of the folks who are actually in those jobs have one. So what that's called, people, is degree inflation. It's a real thing, and it's something that we need to be thinking about, and businesses need to rethink their hiring expectations, relook at their job descriptions, and, re and rejigger their software that's screening people out for arbitrary reasons. Businesses aren't need to be an equal part in this. The third big bucket of disconnection, and this is the one that gets me the most, it's labor force participation rate. 28,000 of those 41,000 people that I just talked about are opportunity youth, so they're not in school, they're not working, and they're not actively looking for work. They're not even in the game. And if they're not even in the game, we gotta, this is probably one of our biggest, most intractable problems that we gotta be thinking about. But there's all kinds of reasons for that, from being locked up, mental and physical disabilities. We gotta do everything we can to mobilize our people, our resources, our expertise, our knowledge, to break down some of these systemic barriers that are not allowing people to even participate in the game. The second goal that's anchoring this work is half the gap. So we said, when we did our research, we realized that there's big disparities by place, by neighborhood in San Diego County. And so we said, you know what, it's not just enough to reduce youth disconnection by 2020. We actually gotta focus our attention, our energy, and our resources on the neighborhoods that need opportunity the most. And so we said by 2020, no neighborhood should actually have more than 4.4%. We did some modeling, not important right now, you can talk to me after if you're interested. We said no neighborhood can have 4.4% higher than the county average. And on this front, we actually did pretty good. We're actually on track to hit our goal by early by 2018. So that's something that we should be celebrating and accelerating. And in fact, of the eight biggest areas of disconnection, and, these, and by the way, these are eight of our most low-income neighborhoods, there's some big serious gains. Six out of the eight actually made improvements. Vista, for example, the city of Vista last year when we talked about this had the highest rate of disconnection at 18.6%, almost twice the county average. In 2016 data, they went down to 15.1%. Again, that's something to be celebrated and accelerated. That's a good thing. There we go. But as we kind of continue to learn about this and dig into the data ourselves with some of our research partners, another trend emerged that we absolutely have to talk about. San Diego, the city of San Diego and the county of San Diego has the second highest African American youth disconnection rate in the country. And actually the largest, the, the highest, the largest disparity between black and white youth of any large city and in fact, this says 20.3%, but new, the newest data from Measure of America so that the city of San Diego has a 26% black African-American African disconnection rate. And new research using big data from Ross Chetty from Stanford University actually controls for everything you could think of that could predict outcomes. Controls for income, controls for family education levels, controls for the street that you live on, even controls for where a child went to school and yet all those things being equal, black children still had a much less likely chance of upward mobi mobility than white children. And so yes, this conversation is about coming of age in San Diego, and yes, this conversation is about poverty, and yes, this conversation is about place and neighborhood, but it's also about race. Not talking about that is a luxury we cannot afford, it's a privilege that we've got to check at the door. We do have to be thinking about some of the historical and current institu institutional racism that plagues some of our, our cities in our county's biggest systems. This can't be America's finest city for some of us if it's not America's finest city for all of us. Despite some of these sobering data, like, I do remain optimistic. Like we are making some progress on some of this stuff. So there's some stakeholders who I think can really move the needle on the, the African American youth disconnection rate who are meeting regularly, building some ideas and some systems that I do think can move the needle. And if you, you want to be a part of that, come find me and join me. We actually need some help. Local media, elected officials, philanthropy circles, business associations, they're talking about this data, they're talking about it. They're prioritizing this. And we're starting to change the narrative in San Diego about youth disconnection. 
some of our school districts are looking at this data at school board meetings and making decisions about investments around specific interventions that can close the leaky educational pipeline. And some of our largest employers and our public employers, the city and the county of San Diego, have made large investments in youth employment, starting with their own workforces. So there are things moving from when we started this movement last year to this year. So I do remain optimistic. But the biggest reason that I remain optimistic is all of you. Like I said, we got 800 people here. And last year, a lot of you were here. You guys did some human-centered design exercises and came up with some thinking around what are the biggest things that we need to tackle if we're going to actually achieve our goal of having the gap and cutting the rate by 2020. And we, working with the Opportunity Council, those, young, those men and women that I just mentioned, we designed this day in direct response for that. I'll close with this. Over the last year or so, I've got the opportunity to speak with a lot of groups and individuals about the youth disconnection crisis in San Diego County. And, and I do my thing, I say my piece, and then someone usually raises their hand, like, you know, what is it about millennials and the generation after you guys? You guys are just, you don't want to work. And I never, ever really have a good answer to that. So eventually, I was having coffee with a young lady named Jasmine on our Opportunity Youth Council, and I said, you know, Jasmine, I always get this question, and I, I never really answer it right, and I kind of stumble with it. Like, what would you say? If someone asked you that, what would you say? And she kind of looked down. She gathered her thoughts. She looked me right in the eye, and she said, you know, I'd ask that person if they'd ever gone to bed hungry. I'd ask that person if they ever played with rocks outside on the concrete because they didn't have any toys to play. And I would ask that, that person if they ever stayed up all night watching their baby sister while their mother pulled a double shift to make rent. This conversation is about talking and solutions and sharing ideas. But there's 150 young people here who are experts in this work because they lived it. And so let's also make this day about listening to people like Jasmine. Because if the youth are not initiated into the village, They'll burn it down just to feel its warmth. Let's get to it.